Kristen. Uh, for those of you who don't know Kristen from the studio, she's a ceramic artist and educator born in Connecticut uh, and raised in the suburbs of Chicago. Uh, now she lives here. Uh, Kristen have, has over 15 years of experience in clay as well as a background in architecture. Um, she has a BFA in environmental art from Otis College of Art and Design. Uh, she currently teaches adult ceramic classes at the Community Center of La Cunada Flipridge and the Creative Arts Group in Sierra Madre. Uh, she's a resident artist at Amoca and also teaches classes here. And tonight is the opening of her new exhibition, Community in Blue, since you can't read it up there. I said that for your effect. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Kristen Erickson. delighted and terrified to be up here <laughs> talking to you guys uh, about my project. Um, so first I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you um, to the wonderful people at Amoca who gave me this opportunity and to the community uh, of Amoca who has supported me emotionally. Um, <laughs> Specifically, Heidi, oh, she's not here. Heidi really uh, got the ball rolling and uh, said, do you want to have a show in the vault? And I said, yes, please. Um, Beth Ann, thank you so much for giving me this amazing opportunity. Um, Andrea, she's put up with some crazy from me, thank you. <laughs> and her graphical wranglings, thank you, thank you. Um, Israel Oscar Javier Alonso, these guys work magic and wood and drywall here at Amoca, and they built that table and painted that perfect yellow arc in the vault, and it's gorgeous, and so a uh, big thank you to them. Sarah um, has been my friend and my cheerleader and total emotional supporter, thank you. And Veronica, I don't know if my studio mate Veronica is here, but she's put up with, um, I actually share a studio in the back with this very talented woman and her dog, and she's put up with a lot of clutter lately. So 231 bottles takes up a lot more space in a 10 by 10 uh, area than I thought. And my husband, Steve, um, I don't know how to use PowerPoint. He actually uh, put the slides together. He ran to uh, labels. He went to Kinko's. He totally um, put up with late nights. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I'm going to just, I'm going to tell the story. I'm going to trace the line uh, to what led to this project. Um, so like Beth Ann said, I was born in Connecticut. I was born in a little town called Danbury. A pretty, um, I grew up in a rural uh, neighborhood very nearby called Brookfield. Uh, spent my time running around in the woods like a feral child with my sister and the neighborhood kids. And um, Really, my favorite pastime was climbing trees. And when, it's about a few years later, uh, we, my family moved to Illinois, uh, the suburbs of Chicago. So culturally, it proved to be very different from the woods of Connecticut. And I actually, some of you were here for a lecture that I did here, and this is the story I tell because, over and over again, because it's the beginning of me and Clay. Um, so when we moved, I experienced this culture shock, and I had a hard time relating to kids um, my age. Because they were into malls and clothes and stuff, and I just wanted to climb trees and dig up worms and, and whatnot. So um, there was this amazing family counselor who said to my parents, she obviously likes to make things, because I would always take things apart, put things back together, recreating stuff. Why don't you really her in a class, in a community space? A community art class. And um, at the age of 12, I walked into my first ceramic studio and I found the beginning of the path. And I started making, um, it became my refuge. Oh, I, sh I have pictures here to show you. <laughs> so, here's my family <coughs> in Connecticut. You may have seen this before. Um, I was the youngest of four. So this is back in Connecticut. And then when we moved, uh, and I started doing clay, and it just became this refuge to me. 
in high school, I used to forge hall passes so that I could skip out of study hall and go to the studio. So here's me at 18, and um, I was doing straight up pottery. I, I, it was just years of functional, functional, functional. I love the fact that you could create a thing that you could hold, interact with, use. I love that it's a vessel for food, for plants, for liquid, what have you. And um, it became this compulsion. I just, I just wanted to keep making stuff that you could use. It just it blew my mind. <coughs> Wood and metal. And I started, I became a carpenter's apprentice um, when I was 18. Or no, excuse me, when I was 20, I became a carpenter's apprentice. And I studied under him for two years. And I also got into welding. So here's a photograph of me <laughs> welding a big thing. And Dolly, Dolly was on this project with me as well. Um, this was actually in college. So I was taking woodworking and metalworking classes back in Illinois. And then um, became obsessed with furniture and decided to pursue furniture design as um, my career path. And so when I came out to Otis to study furniture design, um, I actually ended up doing a lot more architecture than furniture and environmental design and exhibit design. So this is a project that me and Dolly and uh, another friend of ours, Robert, worked on. Um, and it was, oh, it was furniture for art share in Los Angeles. And it was actually furnishing low-income uh, artist lofts. So this was a big metal structure that we created together. And then it got populated with bits of wood. But I don't have the finished product of that. So in college, this is a, an exhibit. Um, this is our senior show. Dolly would remember, uh, and it was a group project that the entire class worked on together. Um, so we worked on landscape, we worked on exhibit, we worked on architecture, and zero clay, because they didn't have clay at the time. So I took 10 years off of clay, and I felt it, it's weird, when you get addicted to clay. It gets in your bloodstream and you can literally feel it in your muscles. So I used to go, I would go to um, stores or shows that had handmade pottery and I would touch them and I would try to feel how the maker held their fingers. And I would get in trouble sometimes because often they would be like, don't touch it. And Steve, my husband, would be like, no, she knows what she's doing. <laughs> but um, but I, I took 10 years off, and during that 10 years, I finished up school, graduated in 2003 with the BFA, and uh, went on to a career in architecture, and loved it. I loved that you could create a space for people to interact with, for them to occupy. It's, it was like setting the stage for, for a life. It was amazing. I miss it. And then the economy crashed. And when I met people, and they said, what do you do? Less and less I could say I practice architecture. It became, I look for work, full time. That was my job, I look for work. And I felt like a lost soul. And I really didn't think I would get emotional. It's this guy's fault. <laughs> right here, that guy. Uh, we were dating at the time and uh, shacking up. And, <laughs> and he said, You know, you keep talking about how much you miss clay. Why don't you just go back to it? What if we, like, just take a class, just do something? And the same way that it became a refuge for me as a child and as a teenager. It was my refuge again, as an adult, and it was great. And I haven't, I haven't turned back. I haven't turned back. So it's, it's a, uh, that's Stephen Joya, um, my now husband. So what's next? Ah, so one day, the screen. One day, while we were shacking up with Steve. 
Um, we were living in Silver Lake. I was taking classes. I was making things. And I want to go back to that muscle memory really quick. The first time I sat down on the wheel after, it was 10 years. It was a 10-year hiatus. After 10 years, I was able to throw. I threw a big bowl. My body remembered. It becomes a part of you. It was incredible. So I'm throwing stuff, making functional wear and bowls and whatnot. Lots of bowls. Um, I opened up my garage, and I had been making so much stuff, and I wasn't selling any, anything at the time, so uh, some of you potters might know how um, the wares can pile up. Uh, I had a piece of bisqueware, so incomplete piece of ceramic work, but not totally finished. It was sitting on a low shelf. And when I opened up the garage door, I had looked at that several times, like over a month, and this one time I opened it up, and there was Something weird going on. There's a structure stuck to the side of my pot. <coughs> and it was like these tubes, tube-like structure, and they seemed to be made of clay. It was a mud dauber's nest. So a mud, a mud dauber is a wasp, and it's also known as a potter's wasp. They go out and they gather clay and they create these structures that are their nests, and they lay eggs in them, and they stuff them full of bugs and stuff for their, their children to eat when they hatch. And then they seal the door, and so when the eggs hatch, the young have their food, they eat the food, and then they open the door and they leave, and then there's this wonderful structure left behind. And it just blew my mind. Here's a picture of the, the wasp, like literally making a pot. So these insects, are both architects and potters, just like me. And I got really excited about that. And, uh, and I wanted in on the market. So I started to create these structures for insects. These are little pinch pots. And uh, my idea was I was a developer for spiders, probably. Um, and I went up around, when we were living in Los Angeles at the time, I went up and I glued them up around the city with this idea that, A, I was making habitat. I was, I was once again an architect, uh, just on a very tiny scale. Um, but also, I wanted to create <coughs> moments for people, for pedestrians. It, it, it was a form of graffiti art. It was like an offering to create small discoveries for people to find. Um, not some big thing that all the world can see, but just a little moment, a special little moment. Um, and I did see them as offerings. A lot of them did get scraped off. But some of them are still hanging on. There's one outside of the ceramic studio on the building at the Glendale Community College by the ceramic studio next to a planter back entrance, if you ever want to go there. Um, and then this grouping, to the Craft and Folk Art Museum in the alleyway, with their blessing. So, so far nobody's scraped it off yet. So these forms took different shapes. They grew in scale. They became larger. Of course, growing up in scale makes them larger. Uh, some of them would look like fruit. Some of them would look like breasts. Some of them looked like a tiny whale and a clown shoe had a baby. <laughs> and I started to make groupings of them. And it became something else. They started talking to each other as they multiplied. These are actually shakers. So I started putting little clay balls inside and uh, trapping them in there. When you first get them out of the kiln, when you shake it, you hear nothing. And then you give it a smack. Like you get So these groupings talked, um, and then I started selling. And people started to really respond to these groupings. And I started to think, is it because they're like a family? Because of how they're talking to each other? They seem to have relationships with each other. Do people see that in that? And so when the opportunity came up to have a show in the vault, I presented all different kinds of things that got shut down, understandably. 
Um, but I came to the, the, this picture was the impetus of the show that's in the vault right now. Um, Beth Ann and Andrea saw it and said that, we want that. What about a table full of that? So I started to think, okay, what does a table full of that mean? If a grouping, if a small grouping is a family, what does a large grouping become? It becomes a community. Okay, what kind of community do I want to talk about? I want to talk about my community. I live here in Pomona. I work here in Pomona. This is, this is my home, and this is the community that I want to work for. So, this is, I love this symbol. These are the four P's of Pomona. This is our six P, four, oh gosh. <laughs> Thank you. I can count. Six P's of Pomona. Um, they actually represent the six council districts, I believe, and some people say that they represent the original gangs in Pomona. Pomona is, I feel like the cities we live in are what we make them. So, um, I, what, back when we lived in Los Angeles, um, I became really involved with a group called the Bicycle Kitchen. And somebody gave me a bicycle and said, bring it. I was complaining that I wasn't active and I was just sitting at a desk designing buildings all day. And I was given a bicycle and they said, come to the Bicycle Kitchen, we'll show you how to fix it. And I walk in and there's this amazing space full of all different kinds of amazing, talented people working on bikes, like filthy, working on bikes together, covered in grease. And I saw walls of tools again. And I was like, yeah, tools. I haven't worked with tools in so long. I've just been sitting here at this desk. And I ended up volunteering for them for um, about nine years, helping, learning how to fix bikes, and became a, a teacher there. And um, it was so enriching. My outlook on my community changed, and my outlook changed so much that I, I was proud of it, even though where I lived at the time, when I started volunteering, we had huge gang problems. It was not an uncommon thing to hear machine gun fire in the middle of the night. But I was still so proud of my city because there was so many different groups of people working for that city and working it to make it their own, claim ownership. Um, so, I started to ask myself, what do I want to think of? What do I want to work on? Um, and the, at the time, it's actually different now, which is exciting. But at the time, there was a, a very visible increase, visually, of the homeless population in Pomona. And that was the case, and it still is the case throughout LA County and beyond throughout the country. <coughs> big shift happening. Um, and so I started to look at the homeless count, our local homeless count. And the last homeless count was in June of 2016. And we had uh, a group of volunteers, it was volunteer driven count, um, uh, 689 homeless people were counted. Um, and it was interesting because that count only had one number. It wasn't broken down by ethnic background, gender, age. It was just one number. So I turned to the Los Angeles County counts, and I started to read these stories about how the female homeless population has exploded, exploded. Over the last three years, it's gone up 55%. That's one in three homeless people in Los Angeles County are women. And I started to hear these stories of women who suffer such horrendous violence because they just don't, they're not, they don't have a door to lock. Uh, women who, in order to keep themselves safe, dress as men, not necessarily because they identify with that gender, but because they just want to hide the fact that they're women. Women who keep themselves up all night long do not sleep so that they can hear if somebody is walking up to where they are. And then they go and try to work a job. Who can hold a job down like that when they're sleep deprived? It's 
It's unimaginable. Um, so these women, and, and, and it's still growing. These women are so vulnerable. So I decided, oh yeah, statistics, sorry. I should have put this up when I was talking about the statistics. Um, so I started to look into like, okay, what's the solution? Do they need to be, they, they need shelter, they need to be in shelters more. No, actually, mixed gender shelters are just as dangerous. So, um, there's a lot of movement now to create more uh, female-only shelters. We have one in Pomona, it's for women and their families, and it's called um, Our House. And uh, it's run by an organization, the Inland Valley Hope Partners. Um, so back to the project, back to my community. This is the city flag of Pomona. A lot of us who live here don't know it. We have a city flag. And it's this beautiful blue and yellow and white. And I decided that I was gonna use these numbers and these colors to represent uh, that one part of the homeless issue. Now it's multifaceted. There's no one answer, but if, if I could just focus on one little part of the issue, um, I'd be able to communicate something and start a dialogue and start that conversation. So the colors of the ballers are blue for the blue field on the city flag. The white is for the white stripe and the, the white of the seal. And the yellow is for that single yellow stripe and the Pomona text. So not only is this an installation, oh, let's talk about numbers. Back to numbers, sorry. Um, I do not have time to make 689 bottles. So, I thought back to that one in three. One in three of homeless people in Los Angeles County are women. What if I created one third of the bottles? What if I took one third of those bottles and made them actually represent the women and create a visual diagram of this information that is, is um, trying to communicate the information that are in all the counts and stuff? So for every bottle in that room, each bottle represents three people. So try to triple in your head that grouping. Um, so there are two, actually I threw in an extra. There's 231, not 230, there's 231. Because the count, I, I just, I am so grateful for the work of these volunteers. But what if somebody was missed? Right? These women hide themselves. They physically have to hide themselves. So I wanted to put that extra in there to, to acknowledge the people who weren't physically counted. Um, and it's a fundraiser. The sale of every bottle uh, raises proceeds for that shelter I spoke about a second ago, the Our House Shelter. Um, that's for women and their families. And the proceeds will go directly into their emergency fund. So the emergency fund is for when they're ready to leave the shelter and actually have their own home. This will cover moving costs. Or if somebody's car breaks down while they're trying to get to work, this will help fix it, or at least contribute to, to that fund. Um, so obviously, there are a lot of artists in this room. Uh, and I'm all different kinds of artists. I see a woodworker back there. Um, and as artists, we are literally holding a microphone in our hand. So um, I would love to encourage you to promote conversation about anything that you might be inspired to start a conversation with whether it's just a single piece or a grouping. And, and uh, 
make your community your own.